Lunch was good. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Do you think, um, <laughs> thank you uh, for coming out and talking about uh, all this fun stuff with me too. Can you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Jordan Green. Um, together with my wife, Laura, we own j l Green Farm up in Edinburgh. Um, we've been doing this since 2009. And then what all do you raise, cultivate, or do up there? So we're mostly in the uh, meat space. So, you know, pastured, uh, poultry. Um, we used to do layers, uh, you know, as well as broilers and turkeys, now just broilers and turkeys. Uh, forest and pasture raised pigs. And grass-fed beef is kind of a main part of what we do now. And do one, do one of them lead over the others or to take up more time? Or is it just kind of like a balance between... Um, it's it's a balance really driven by the market. You know, what, what are customers looking to buy? What markets can we find for the products? Uh, we lean pretty heavily in the pig direction because our properties that we manage are more suited for pigs. Uh, you know, we manage about 500 acres and over 300 of that is wooded. So yeah. hard to do broiler chickens in the woods. Uh, but yeah, we can do a lot of pigs and that's kind of where our market opportunity has also developed over the last 15 years. And so that's the direction that we've taken our main enterprise our centerpiece the bulk of it and then have, have the the types of pigs that you're raising um changed over those 15 years um well initially we were buying piglets from other places and finishing them like a lot of you know regenerative you know back then it was sustainable now it's regenerative right. what they're doing um we pretty quickly though identified that we needed to start breeding our own um, because there's three things that you look for in pigs um, when you're when you're trying to source them from somewhere else is quantity quality and cost and you know if you can get quantity and quality then you can stomach some cost you know and they kind of balance with each other back in you know 2010 we couldn't find quantity we couldn't find quality and it didn't matter what the cost was so we pretty quickly um, started breeding our own pigs and we developed a closed herd um, based on some duroc and hampshire and a little bit of yorkshire genetics oh no kidding and so for the last 10 years we've had a closed herd where we are essentially breeding our own, um, you know, subline uh, of pigs that are suited well for the management system that we operate in. How different is this from seed saving? Like, you know, like for a lot of farms, it's, it, it's once you start doing that too, right. like keeping a lineage going as opposed to knowing where it comes from, how much does that benefit like the consumer of the farm? Uh, it's probably similar in that it's a line breeding program yeah. that, that you're closing a genetic pool, you're not introducing any new genetic material and then you're going through a process of weeding out all of the subpar genetics that are then brought to the surface. So your your first couple of years will be rougher uh, because you're having to deal with all these uh, recessive gene traits and you got to get all, rid of all of them, but then you can have a pretty uh, consistent and pure line after that. And so that's kind of what we work with now is a, is a pig that's really suited for Virginia forests and pastures that does well, you know, four seasons that we have here um it, it's really acclimated to our context here in the valley and then so i mean uh, pigs obviously are not not n- native to the the area um but for pigs that over the centuries though that have either proven well or, or work well in this landscape because like I, I barely know different breeds of pig, like i know hampshire like or, or, or is it berkshire berkshire is yeah one. berkshire see i know them very well yeah. but like i've learned also ball and like some of these other types but like i don't have a context for what they actually like what that difference is is there usually like a pretty good like you you named three different types that were kind of like right so what so what, what each area of that what is it um well i mean for us it was those were the genetics that we pulled from when we started so we, we didn't go out and say oh what's the best genetics for an outdoor pig production okay yeah then go from there it went we just went from what's the best pigs that are working for us here in our unique context and then working you know from that point forward um, you know, pigs that work well in Virginia might not work well, say, in Texas or in, you know, northern Canada. So really it's developing a pig or, you know, a species or a breed of pig, let's say, that is suited for your specific um, climate, you know, where, where you are. Um, like uh, many years ago, I was down in Haiti and they have pigs there as well. And they're almost all black pigs. Yeah. Because they, they can tolerate the heat really well. And they had them tied up with collars and chains to trees on the beach to keep them in the yeah well just to, that's what you do you you know, have your pig in the house at night you take your pig out during the day and you oh, tie it up to a tree is. on the beach and you know it eats whatever sea life might have washed ashore in the tides and yeah, stuff and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know there'd be a sow with four or five piglets out there just tied up to a tree and you know if so you, you were in, back home and you're like i want that <laughs> well yeah if, if you were to take a uh 
uh, you know, a Yorkshire or a land race pig from a, a confinement facility yeah. and do something like that, it would be dead in a few days. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's not acclimated to that environmental pressure. It's trying to changes. Yeah. So in terms of, also, this is just a side question. I, I've known this for a while, but I've never understood why. Why can't you milk pigs? I, I think they just won't let you. They just, they're like, that's it. Right. Because kind of all the animals, though, too. Like, that's the only one where you don't take something for, like, chickens, you get eggs, and you can eat the meat. Uh, uh, like, uh, I'm sure there's uh, traditions. Uh, you know, pigs are, pigs are one of the oldest domesticated animals that, that humans have. And I'm sure there are traditions uh, of milking pigs in okay. certain areas, but it's not something, you know, their production is probably not super high. And, uh, you know, you still have to feed all those piglets. Right. You know, it's not like there's an X surplus above what the piglets need. No. And also, I don't know how well they would train to, you know, just kind of standing there and letting you Take milk that. them. So, I just something that I've always been curious about, because you do look up like cheeses, like the most expensive cheeses in the world come from a donkey in Siberia. Really? And it, yeah, it's just weird stuff. Anyways, huh. I, I digress. I'm sure there's, you know, farmers are so... Uh, innovative in things that they've tried yeah yeah sure somewhere there's like a whole subculture of mil milking pigs and a whole you know like cheese culture around it i'm just not familiar <laughs> no no me neither but one day i'll figure that stuff out but in terms of like the the daily i mean you're talking about these pigs in haiti too that you know spend indoors and go outdoors what's kind of like the day-to-day -day like uh life like for for pigs on your farm so we developed a production model by looking at how do pigs interact with nature in a wild setting you know there's a lot of wild pigs around the world um, and almost every continent there's there's wild pigs and you see that they are a an edge species they they like to be able to come out into fields when it's cool you know a lot of times at night but then they want to retreat into the forest during the the heat of the day and also for cover from you know predators uh, and then also during the the mast season for whatever the local species of trees are that's when they would for, forage heavily in the forest itself Right. So, you know, looking at what, how do pigs like to operate in nature? How can we then develop a production model around that on a commercial template of a farm and kind of balance between those two that, yes, we have to have a level of concentration and organization. Yeah. More typical of, you know, a farm, but pigs in nature have been together for a long time. Yeah. And obviously there's a, a symbiosis between the two. Um, and, you know, how do we strike that balance between putting the pigs in that natural environment, letting them express that, you know, innate part of, of what they are and also be able to do things like harvest the acorns and the, the hickory nuts and stuff. So for us, it's developing a protocol of, all right, you know, we always want pigs to be moving. Uh, we don't want to keep them in any one, one spot. A, they run out of stuff to eat pretty quickly and B, they start overloading the soil pretty quickly with yeah. nutrients, which oh, is a thing they dig out so quickly. Uh, you know, digging can be a problem. Yeah. Um, but primarily the nutrient overload is, is the thing that you have to manage that, uh, you know, so pigs put down a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus and, po and potassium right in their manure. Um, if you look at like the Chinese, um, are often credited as the first to really domesticate pigs and, and use them. Um, in fact, if you look at the, uh, the Chinese, uh, calligraphy for home, it's a symbol of a house with a pig underneath it. <laughs> And then so, but they primarily used pigs, not for meat. They used them for their manure. Right. Because pigs were so good at converting um, brands and other, you know, trash, trashy type food yeah, stuff you wanted. into highly uh, phosphoric manure, which if you look at soil in China, in China, it is chronically deficient in phosphorus. And what is one of the main staple crops in Chinese culture is rice, right. yeah. which is one of the most phosphorus demanding crops that's out there so they were okay. using she's so many pigs that like tied in with cold. okay so they were using pigs for the manure yeah and yeah they would eat them on occasion but it was the manure that they wanted and compost you have your trash system. yeah you'd have you literally would have it under the house yeah and so all of your table scraps just went down there oh, they, they would wow. also eat all the human you know, manure yeah, yeah, as yeah. well and then convert that into this you know this this pig manure that they could then take out to the rice paddy are there any downsides of building like stuff, I mean, modern day though, like, I mean, you can have your plumbing though, but like to put pigs underneath the house. 
For me, the smell would probably be the oh, first thing. Yeah. See, already I was just yeah. like the benefits way outweigh the cons. I don't know, you know, not it. It take a very uh, particular yeah. kind of woman that would be okay with you having the herd of pigs underneath the house. Oh, that's yeah. fine. I can work on. She that. just flips a little door open in the kitchen, and you know, yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. well, I do all the cooking anyway. But yeah, so I, you know, going back to that that uh, nutrient overload is yeah often overlooked in the regenerative pastured pig space. Let's say. But that's one of the, the number one things we need to be paying attention to is that we're not overloading the soil either on the pasture or in the woods with nutrients by having 50 pigs camped out on one acre forever. Yeah. Now, and in, in terms of farms too, because this is something that I found interesting, and it may just be the ones that I go and visit or the folks that I talk to though, but are, like, are you guys pretty normal for, for the structure of a farm you have in terms of the animal uh, uh, living space? Is that do you see that around a lot or is that very infrequent because like i feel like i go to a lot of farms and i find pigs running around the woods uh, then i'm where i talk to but then i think i'm just like i'm just going to those farms sure sure right because yeah, i'm yeah. finding those people that bias it. selected yeah yeah i'm going to the like yeah i'm not going to any conventional farms though but is right. that is that something that's pretty prolific or is that something that you see very infrequently uh probably less than one percent of pigs raised in the united states are raised yeah. outdoors okay um, <clears throat> yeah and even a, a smaller percentage of them are managed uh, you know, in, intensively managed in the woods or on the pasture. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, li- I like to think that we're really not reinventing a, a whole lot of knowledge, but we're rediscovering, um, you know, ways that pigs were raised traditionally in the Appalachians and in the Valley for hundreds of years. Yeah, before this concentration into you know large confinement houses uh, went on. You know, it used to be you'd have the herd of pigs out there and a couple drovers with them, and they're just driving them up into the mountains for the summer and the fall to graze on acorns. Yeah. You know, and then bringing them all back down in the early winter. And each farm has their pigs identified by different ear notches that are in them. So you know whose pigs go where and all that. Oh, funny. So it was just everyone threw them up together. Yeah. You would put them into one communal herd and then push them up into the mountains. Uh, oh. you know, and then you have things like the uh, great Appalachian hog drives. Yeah. Of, you know, from starting maybe early 1700 well into the 1800s of uh, hundreds of thousands of pigs a year being raised in the Appalachian mountains and then walked down to the Carolinas you know very much like the cattle drives from Texas yeah, yeah, you know yeah. to Chicago um, you'd have these pig drives from all of Appalachia down into the Carolinas and Georgia every year why would they take them down there um, because they were selling them to the plantations uh, so oh, yeah. you, you have the plantation um, agricultural culture right that that's all they wanted to do was this cash crop. So they didn't want to set aside man for livestocking and, uh, or acreage for livestocking, you know, and for raising this meat. Plus you don't want pigs around your high value, crop, yeah. you know, your cotton or tobacco or whatever yeah. you're doing. You don't want the, the risk of the pigs going through and tearing all that up. One yeah. Time. So it was far more, you know, it was a business decision for the issue because he used the mountains though for that purpose. So yeah. you, yeah, you'd have the mountain people are raising pigs and then walking them, 10 miles a day and you can't have cattle in the same situation <clears throat> yeah no bring yeah bring yeah mountains don't work well for cattle because cattle need grass yeah. pigs are so adaptable such a wide variety of of food that they could live in the mountains on the acorns you know on chestnuts uh acorns hickory nuts berries yeah. all this stuff that's up there and then they would bring them down to the carolinas and into georgia and sell them to the plantations and there was more more pigs made that journey from appalachia to to the deep south than cattle did from Texas to Chicago in the cattle drive. What was the last time this happened? I think it was like uh, 1850s was when it oh, started okay. fading out. Yeah, I, I, that fits the narrative. Um, but it is interesting because I mean, I, so it was one of those things too that I, I remember learning early on too, like uh, Hamon Abedico and like in, in Iberia, so like Spain and Portugal, like th- that's all they talk about. Mm-hmm. And like, I thought they were doing something totally different. Like, cause they're, they're apparently that's the best pig in the world. Right. And that's just marketing. Right. But, it's like you know, but they, all the all the acorns that they would eat, all the yeah. stuff that they would in that where they get to run around, they get to do this stuff, and then realizing that this stuff still happens out here as well. And when you're saying less than one percent too, that's that's globally, nationally. I would say in the United States, in the U.S. Okay, so it's yeah. not a very big practice, but it seems like there's a lot of farms doing. And not again in context, there, there's a good number of farms that are doing this in Virginia, at least that I've met. Are there different styles of doing it too? Like how long you leave them in the woods? Like yeah. It, I think everyone kind of has their own take on it that, you know, we're just trying to restart this outdoor pig thing. And so yeah. you'll have, uh, 
you know, similar with, with cattle farms, you'll have cow farms with this continuous graze where the herd just has the whole farm all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, same thing with some pig farms where the pigs will just have this one field all the time. And then you'll have others that are more uh, into the, the intensive management of them. Like, all right, we're going to move them, yeah. you know, uh, continually to, to spread out the manure, to allow time for the soil to regenerate and, you know, for the forages to rejuvenate. Um, you know, and then there's some who are even to the level of crazy of, all right, we're going to move the pigs every day so that we don't have to have as much external feed coming in and try to capture as much oh. you know, natural uh, food stuff as we yeah, can. Yeah, and it's what offset do you want too though. So, so in terms of, um, of terms, g- gotta love greenwashing. Oh, that's funny because, <laughs> yeah, uh, your name's, but I was going to say, <laughs> touche, touche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> um but uh, but in terms of terms, what are terms that people should be asking then farmers too when you hear like so pasture raised, right? That's what that means. No, but pasture raised it, it basically just means the animals outside. Yeah, I mean I, I I know of farms that use the term pasture raised for their pigs, and their pasture would be pretty synonymous with like a gravel pig sty. Well, like a, you know a gravel quarry because you know the pigs have been there for so long that there's yeah. absolutely nothing left. Now, is that better than a confinement house? For the, the, the pig's uh, welfare, probably so, but arguably for the environment, not as much. Yeah. Because you, know, you have this nutrient runoff occurring. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my, my kind of biggest fear is that the, the movement of bur- put, putting pigs from the barn back out into the field uh, is that, you know, we farmers don't kind of screw it up to the point where we're causing more environmental damage yeah. than, than the confinement houses are just trying to capture that pastured label or, you know, that well, that yeah. gap five certification or something. Um, you know, pigs are a very intensive animal. They're very, they have very destructive tendencies. Yeah. And so our management has to be on par with their need of, of proper care and proper management. But what they do, that's, that's why I'm always finding it so fascinating that like pigs, and I see, I do, I try to do this with every animal too, like see where they pop up in culture and media and other things like that too, like the cocky rooster, right? Like, mm. and then you see foghorn, leghorn, right? And stuff like that. But then same thing with pigs and they do get known for, you know, dirty. I mean, every, everything in every culture is almost like if you see someone, you know, being a mess or, or, or anyways, being less than exemplary as a right. citizen, call a pig. Right. Right. So it's, it's really interesting to me. And it, it, even in certain religions too, how they get kind of put into certain buckets but it's always been funny to me it's it's never usually the pigs it's always just how people have <laughs> made treated them pig styes and you know the notion of it just being uh, contained in this very small area so i think now you're seeing more practices where people are getting in tune with how they should be raised how they work with nature i'm seeing this with cat cattle breeds as well mm-hmm. things that are more adapted to the environments that they're actually being put in right um now do you find though that that on on a case-by-case basis like there's certain breeds of pig that can go back out into the wild like can can this happen with all pork raised meats in the u.s i mean it's it's interesting what you were saying there a few minutes ago about you know the the reputation of pigs being tied to the people it's i find it kind of interesting that the 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 species that is anatomically the closest to us humans isn't often the the uh, shadow reflection of how we treat them yeah uh you know and the the kind of impact the, the i guess reflection we could take on that on um, you know, how we treat ourselves and how we treat animals, pigs will give you that pretty good mirror in the wall to look at. Yeah. Of, you know, if we're not caring well for them, you're going to start seeing problems. Yeah, well, you're, you're going to see cannibalistic behaviors, antisocial behaviors, uh, and even at levels of, of concentration and mismanagement, pathogenicity uh, level you know, problems, uh, you know, things like uh, PDB that they've had in China, uh, ASF, you know, these diseases that have killed hundreds of millions of pigs, um, that is a direct result of poor management practices. Right. Not because it's a dirty animal or, you know, a, a diseased animal. It's how us humans are taking care of that animal. So I always get into this too, especially around a lot of meat products nowadays too. It, I mean, you have the conventional side of things, which is usually, I think pretty unanimously people will agree is pretty atrocious, right? Or it doesn't really work out, but it's the same thing too. It's like, you can look at how things have gotten to the the phases that they're at. And then now a lot of the practices seem to be turning back towards having animals that live really good lives and then have one really bad day, mm-hmm. but also just in terms of you actually get better product out of something that has a better life. Right. Is that something you agree with? Well, I, I think if you, you look at nature 
has to exist with everything in a balance. And but you can cheat nature for a short period of time. Um, you know, we look at the uh, the advent of antibiotics mm-hmm. when those were in, you know came onto the scene early 1900s. We had this golden age of antibiotics for 60, 70, 80 years. That's now um, you know, we're being told is drawing to a close where yeah. we, we overused no this this uh, you know gift that nature had. Um, you know, uh, given us and we overused it and abused it. And now that window is closing rapidly on things that we can use it for. Um, and I think the same exists in livestock and, you know, specifically for pigs, that it's such an adaptable animal that, yes, you can put pigs in a building at a concentration of, you know, just a few square feet per animal. Right. And you can get away with that for 50, 60 years, but then nature comes along and basically makes an adjustment. And so, you know, th- that this this constant balance of 5149, the yeah. one side of, of host versus pathogen that eventually flips over. Yeah. And so, you know, our management causes this this flip that, you know, now we have given the upper hand to um, to pathogens and it renders a production model uh, basically obsolete. We can't really use that yeah. well anymore. And with pigs, you know, we see this re-examination of an entire industry going on right now of the way that we're doing things has a host of problems yeah. that we're able to kind of push away and offset and, you know, you know and hide in certain ways, you know, we're, um, everything from, you know, meat quality to uh, disease issues to manure issues to just cost of production issues. All of that is kind of pushed and obscured in different areas and, and made it made it kind of limp along and work yeah. for a period of time. But the wheels are kind of coming off of that. Yeah. And, and so now it's, you know, you look at, say, like the Chinese, their, their answer to it is going all in on the industrial setting. Oh, really? All in. You yeah. know, they, they have these things called hog hotels now that, you know, tens of thousands of sows are birthing hundreds of thousands of piglets. And so you have millions of pigs being raised in one, one campus, facility. one campus, you know, these eight, 10, 12 story tall buildings that are at the top of a, a hill and the pigs are working their way down the hill over the course of their life. Okay. And at the bottom of the hill is the slaughter plant. Yeah. And so you have all of this all in one hermetically sealed unit because wow. they, they've gone all in on the, instead of having a, a, a you know, like a terrain theory of health that Right, your immune system has to interact with nature and to be robust and to fight off disease. Their right. their approach is we're just never going to let anything bad in again, and we're just going to seal it off completely. Oh, and that's that's where they're going. And I you know, would imagine that a lot of conventional commodity pork production will follow in that you know in that mold of instead of um, you know, in, instead of looking at the red flags that nature throws and saying maybe we need right. to re-examine this it's just a doubling down it's, on what you're already it's doing. funny because it's, it's like the healthy ecology of something though too so on one end you have like kind of like the industrial approach and then i feel like in the u.s too we're trying to come up with like we love to see ourselves as the creative one so alternative meat products and like coming up with like the workaround and we used to do this with what was it like almond milk was a big thing too it was like i'm helping so much because it's not bovine milk and then it was like right do you know how much water and <laughs> that is? right and then people would be like ah what do i do so, I mean, what about in terms of alternative meats? Is that a solution then, too, to figuring out a healthier strand of, of let's say, like for pork production? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, alternative meats, really, it's kind of the same thing as like with almond milk. It's not really a milk, but we're just going to put the same label on it because it's hopefully what people associate with. Um, you know, al- alternative meats are a highly processed plant product that has animal connections that maybe people don't really know about like what um so you know one what we were talking about you know earlier on today was this connection between the beef slaughter industry and cultured meats through a product called fetal bovine serum and so uh you know one of the things that we do on our farm is buy these old cows from other producers you know that the cows are just out of cycle with everything that's going on or being retired and so uh, what we found with these older breeding cows is about 40 to 50% of them would have a calf when they came back to our farm for a year. Right. And so I started looking around like, you know, so what is the industry doing 
with all these calves. If, you know, 50% of these cows that are being sent to slaughter have a calf of various gestational age in them, and uh, they actually, there's a lot of value in that. And a lot of times that's what they're buying that old cow for is um, when they kill the cow, they extract the, the, you know, the calf from her, and then they suck all of the blood out of it. And it's turned into this product called fetal bovine serum, which is used both in the vaccine industry and in the cultured meat industry as a matrix for growing uh, a cultured meat. Right. So, you know, you, you are uh, an environmentally and health conscious person who may, is misguided on the, the subject of meat consumption and you're, you're buying, you know, your uh, cultured meat product, not knowing that that, you know, part of the process of that uh, Frank or that burger arriving at your plate is uh, a bath of baby calf blood. Yeah, that's nice. I like thinking about it that way. That should go on the package. But it is, it's something that I think to, to each their own of their opinion and how they reach that too. Um, and, and same thing, like the morals that guide us and wanting to do something, whether for, you know, good reasons, bad reasons, whatever it is though. But like, hey, I don't know, for me personally, I keep trying to eat less meat actually, but higher quality when I do. Sure. And same thing though, trying to look at like, well, how do I get better connected to the landscape? Getting, looking out for the land more to me is like working more with animals, with plants. And figuring out those relationships as opposed to what I find to be the, yeah, that like systematized. I mean, I even do this in the garden where I'm sitting there going like, I want all basil and I'm just going to grow like rows and rows. Of it. It's not healthy. Like, and then I've got to figure out pest management ways and like, right. I've just created a buffet now. Right. So I'm trying to, you know, and I think a lot of that too, is that figuring out what is that balance and how does that look like? It seems like it's kind of exciting in the big world right now. Like, like there are changes around that too. And, and. Uh, different models and modes that from the China model that you were saying, kind of what is the U.S.'s approach to in terms of on the larger scale, uh, like conventional farms converting a lot, or is it impossible for them to do that? Um, so it's in the same genre of continued concentration and and uh, expansion of these facilities into bigger and bigger facilities. I don't think we would see the level of what China is doing because they operate on a, a more limited land base that they're trying to do these farms basically in urban centers so that they're limiting their oh. transportation of product um, from finish to to the consumer um, in the united states you know the kind of the, the philosophy of confinement uh, you know animal agriculture is to have it as far away from people yeah. so people aren't seeing it and so you don't have the little activists around with their drones watching stuff um, and you know to do it far out that's yeah. why you, know, you have like uh here in your know, recent history with the huge barn fire that killed all those dairy cows and then this other one uh, recently in texas of you know cattle being drowned in a, in a feedlot all that is way away from people yeah and so um the, the concentration of animal agriculture is remote and not as uh concentrated for us it's more about keeping it around processing hubs yeah than urban centers so the concentration that you see specifically in the hog industry is this vertical concentration of the actual farmers not owning anything that's involved with the process anymore um, it, it is the same xyz company that's owning the piglets when they arrive in the farm that is selling the uh you know, baloney at the the ball game right the other thing I can use. now and then for you guys on your farm as well though too uh, hey, how, many, how many uh about like in the pig area like how, how many so it varies around, but in a typical year, we harvest about 400 head that okay. we sell to our customers. And then we also sell a couple thousand piglets to other pasture-based uh, farms um, really on the East Coast, all up and down the East Coast. And same thing about scale. This is always a tough question though too, but as far as small farms go, mm -hmm. how big are you? Um, so we would be classified as a large scale. Large scale. Farm, uh, you know, most of them are measured by revenue. And so our revenue is that the difference between a small farm and a big farm? Yeah, it's all based on revenue. Oh, okay, okay. Um, technically, to be a farm, you only have to revenue a thousand dollars a year in sales, which is really not that oh, large. Grow hay, right, right. Yeah. Um, which, when that was established back in the seventies, if yeah. that had been adjusted for inflation, that'd be like over seven, eight thousand dollars now. Oh, okay. Um, so just interesting statistical. So it's still kept at the same. Still amount. kept at the same amount as in the nineteen seventies. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, it's one thing to keep in mind when you hear about this explosion of small farms is well we've lowered the bar yeah or inflation has continued to lower the bar that you know all you need to do is sell a hundred square bales of hay basically and you're yeah your farm um i didn't realize that hadn't changed at all no i hadn't changed since it was 
implemented. And you have to be zoned agricultural though, right? Sure, sure. Uh, industrial versus natural though, but yeah. that, that relationship though, and then how nowadays we think usually if we want to improve something, let's figure out the industrial solution first. I, right. I'm starting to realize it's a balance and that the natural solution sometimes is better, but it doesn't mean just letting things go. Right. Um, so I forget where the, the quote originated from, but one that we, that I, that I like to use a lot is uh, simplicity is the hallmark of good design. And when you have, you know, complex systems with multiple layers of, um, you know, interconnectivity and, and uh, reliance and fragility, like you would see in modern conventional agriculture, that doesn't mean it's a good design. And in fact, we learned that through COVID, it was a very fragile design. Yeah. And so er everything that we do on the farm and developing these systems and management protocols is, it's not how much can we add to it, it's how much can we strip away. Yeah. And, you know, just do, is this actually needed? Can we get rid of this entirely? Do we actually need this? Is that, you know, and then the more that we can align our management practices with nature, the less stuff we end up needing. So you uh, still need some. Yeah. But you don't need as much. Yeah. 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 And what, what you're extracting versus what you're putting back in. Um, and then in terms of, I was like asking this though too, but what are some better questions that people can ask? Uh, pig farmers or if they go to a market and there's a vendor that's selling pork or something like that what are really good questions that they can ask um i mean the, the first question i would ask is are these pigs coming from your farm yeah yeah, yeah that, that that's such an obvious one but sometimes it's the one that needs to be asked is you know is this just a pig that you bought at the auction yeah last week and had slaughtered and, and then brought here it's a fairly common practice so are these pigs that you're actually actually raising um and you know from there it's it's what matters to you are you looking for uh, more of a quality and taste feature or are you more worried about environmental and welfare issues or are you trying to find a balance you know, between the two uh, a lot of times people get hung up on this kind of breed competition of well you know, this is the berkshire pork and then yeah. other guys like this is the Osaba island and this is the mangalitsa and all that and you know i've had pork from all of these pigs and yeah they're all within, you know, spitting distance of each other. Right. Yeah, okay. I mean, you had the Iberico, and I was like, I'm not paying that much money for this kind of work. Yeah, right. it's how it's branded. And then it is kind of funny because, like, I even asked that with branding on sausages in general, too. Um, you know, like, why don't you call it, like, a, a, a you know, not Iberico, a, a Berkshire sausage mm -hmm. or something like that, like, tie right. it to breed. So, no, you don't think there's, like, a massive... There, there are some some differences. Yeah, people highlight it too much. People though. definitely highlight it that, uh, you know, especially in let's say the the heritage breeds of pigs. So we yeah. exclude like the Iberico and the uh, the Mangalitsas and, and that kind of stuff. We're just talking about the standard, you know, English breeds of pigs. Um, they are all pretty similar to each other. Yeah. What really matters is how they're managed. Right. You can you can make the best pedigreed Berkshire taste like garbage. Yeah. And similarly, you can take uh, just a, a mutt between, you know, four different breed mutt, you and you can make it taste fabulous. It, the, what matters to me is, is management over breed. And are there certain terms too, like, like I've seen on different packaging stuff too, forest raised, pasture raised, like these different like raised terms, but are there certain things that people should ask about whether or not it is or it isn't? Um, so, you know, I would ask, are you raising it? Um, and then just tell me how you're raising the pigs. You know, well, then the farmer say, well, they're outside. I would follow that up with, okay, are they being are they being uh, rotationally managed across the farm, or are they just in the same field all the time? Right. Because you know, I wouldn't want to spend extra money um, supporting a you know a local ecological brand rather than have a roof if they're just going to stay in the same space. Sure. Yeah. They, they're, there's well, you, you you say that, but. Are pigs raised in a deep bedded hoop barn yeah. uh, more ecologically sound than ones that are out in a moonscape you know, mud lot? Yeah. Uh, I would say yes, they they are for sure because they're not destroying tons of topsoil, right? You know, and, and washing it off the farm, right? Um, and then you get that rock quarry look. Yeah, yeah, you get that moonscape look. Oh, that's what you. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, so. Um, you're just asking those kind of questions uh, that, you know, as a customer, if you want to direct your money to a more expensive product to support local farms, you want to make sure you're reinforcing the management practices that are 
simultaneously beneficial for the animal and the environment that it's living in as well. Do you like when people ask you a question? I love questions. That's for me. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, we do farm tours occasionally, and for me, it's always about the pigs. Um, and that's kind of where my, my passion is, is with this whole pastured and forest-based uh, pig production model and making it something that is actually ecologically sound and not just a, well, all we did was just took the roof away and threw the pigs out in the field. And, you know, now why are all the river keepers at the front gate protesting? Yeah. Uh, so if people did want to find out more uh, or ask you other questions, where can they find you? How can they go about that too? When are the farm tours? Um, so for farm tours, they can just check out the farm website, jlgreenfarm.com. It'll have all that information there. Um, they can find us on any of the socials at JL Green Farm. If you want to find me, um, I'd be on you know Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube. And I just look up Farm Builder. Cool. Far find farm us. Builder. Farm Builder. Just at Farm Builder. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you again for doing this. I really appreciate okay. it. Always good talking with you. That was good food too. Um, and yeah, I'll be out to the farm again soon. Awesome. It was good to see you, Daniel.